um, Bob Greenier is our next person. Okay. Bob Greenier is the managing director of Greenchild Imaging Solutions and has a bachelor's of engineering, manufacturing engineering. Bob came from a farming background originally, but he's a serial entrepreneur and an ideas man. He's worked in the pharmaceutical, advertising, adult education, and finance industries, along with working with several blue chip companies along the way. His roles have ranged from product and application design and delivery to corporate image and branding. Today, Bob is going to be presenting an overview of exotic vacuum objects and their possible role in Hutchison style effects, nuclear transmutations, and other energy and materials effects that might be applicable to future propulsion and space systems. So, Bob, welcome, sir. Let me hand things over to you and uh, go ahead. If you if you have a PowerPoint, just do screen share. Uh, hi, Tim. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. It's very kind of you. So uh, first up, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to the community for giving me the opportunity to share some ideas uh, and uh, some of our research at the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and my own research. I'd like to thank all the participants uh, in and the supporters of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, MFMP, which was founded in late 2012, and the subscribers to my blog at remoteview.icu, where I publish my own work and the donors that continue to directly support my open research. So I have to say thank you to them to start with. Okay, so if back in May 20, 2013, I shared this video with my lovely pregnant wife, as she was with our first child there. And this was in India, where I was living at the time. And uh, I had been working for the project as a volunteer uh, from late 2012, as I just said, and I wanted to put up an idea, just a quick idea of how I saw um, low energy nuclear reactions uh, being able to be uh, created. And I saw two ways, really, that you can get there. Uh, and one is through shock, and the other one is through resonance. And uh, what you're doing in the shock case is trying to take something far from equilibrium so that then things settle down and things find an equilibrium out of that. Um, and in case of resonance, you're, you're targeting a, a, a um, something which has a high Q factor, something which is able to take energy and not lose it. And the energy just builds and builds and builds. And this is, uh, like Tesla said, uh, a snowball running down a mountain, uh, which he witnessed in Serbia when he was on walking one day and he saw a snowball going down a mountain and it, it, it accreted snow as it came down the mountain, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And he realized that uh, if you could create a system that did that, if you kept adding to the system, sooner or later, it would be able to uh, vanquish or destroy anything. And uh, so we have the two systems here, shock and resonance. And so in the course of this presentation, I want to share um, a little insights as to what an exotic vacuum object is, uh, what exotic vacuum objects can do, um, uh, propulsion and uh, claims of propulsion that have been related to this phenomenon and uh, also uh, a proposed mechanism from myself and the means by which we can get there. So first off, what is an exotic vacuum object? Well, after being commissioned to study the findings of one John K. Hutchison, uh, in 1986, Kenneth Radford Childers published uh, Exotic Vacuum, EVs, A Tale of Discovery. And we have made that available for you on our Facebook, uh, the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Projects Facebook page. And you can search for EV, A Tale of Discovery or Ken Shoulders, and you will find a link to that down book, book which was uh, formerly uh, secret. Um, but uh, through talking about these things since 2017, it came about that someone passed this uh, to a, a colleague and um, they were able to uh, scan and put this into the public domain. I have not read it. The reason that I have chosen not to read it is because I like to run my research in a kind of clean room fashion. So uh, that might seem bizarre to people, but I, I, I delight myself in finding out that someone else already thought something uh, after I've seen it. Now, what you will not see in these uh, pages, these slides, is a lot of uh, equations. I'm not one for equations. Uh, I don't have, a, I'm not averse to equations, but I'm not one for equations. If I can't see something, uh, if, I, if I can't repeatedly see a phenomenon, 
I'm not um, so keen on believing it uh, with just a bunch of equations and hand waving. I like to be able to see something. So my research has really followed that line and it was inspired uh, essentially by a phrase that was said by Ken Shoulders um, that it's so easy to not see things. Uh, uh, you, you, if you don't look, you don't, won't even know what you didn't find. And uh, that, he said that in 2010, and actually in 2015, we were visiting one scientist in this field called uh, uh, Francesco Piantelli. And uh, he said, don't tell nature what it is, let nature show you. And those two phrases stuck in my head, and I, I, I radically changed the way that I was doing the research uh, from 2015 to take on board. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't until 2000, late 2016, early 2017 that I saw the phrase from Ken Shoulders. But from 2015, I, I decided to uh, look at what nature was trying to send as a message. And uh, it comes to that Victor Schauberger phrase, uh, comprehend and copy nature. So, um, so what is an EV? Well, EV electron delidium um, is what he originally called it in the 1980s. And electron is the Greek word for amber, uh, which along with a cat hair was where static electricity was first observed. And so the word electron, the word for amber in Greek gave its name to the particle. Valer is uh, Latin for strong, having power to unite, so it means strong electron. So when he was starting out, he was thinking these things because uh, he was achieving them with electromagnetics and, and uh, electric discharges. He thought these were some form of cohering uh, united electrons, and therefore they were acting as one, uh, and so he was calling them uh, strong electron. But then he realized that it could also contain not only upwards of uh, 10 to the power eight, ele eight electrons, but also as much as one positive ion per uh, 100,000 electrons. And so he renamed it that point, uh, it, it, I think it was somewhere in the 1990s, to high density charge clusters, HDCCs. And then later, Shoulders realized that there, were, that it, there was more interesting things going on than could just be explained by clusters of charges. And so he settled on the name of exotic vacuum objects. And he stated uh, that all sparks, uh, discharge, spark discharges would produce uh, exotic vacuum objects. And he also noted in many of his writings that ball lightning was effectively a related phenomenon. So with that said, um, uh, Ken Shoulders uh, in 2010. So what, what happened was that th there's one video out there. In fact, there's a couple of videos. And it's when John Hutchison had visited with his wife, Nan Nancy Lazarian, the Shoulders household um, in 2010. And Nancy filmed a, 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 a sequence of interviews, which she edited and put out in two videos. I meticulously transcribed that on my steam it channel and there is a link in the presentation at some point i will share this presentation so you can have it uh, but anyway um he said he's asked the question you know you know how do you grow these things and ken shoulders say oh yeah absolutely i started out with baby ones that's just a technique i happen to have that's old but i start with tiny tiny ones and I watch them grow and I can grow them and grow them. And Nancy says, uh, do they feed, uh, do they get feed? What do you feed them? And then Ken Shoulders go, more electrons. They need electrons, they become electrons. And it's an interesting phrase. Uh, and he used, uh, as far as I know, a penning trap uh, because these things can be influenced by electrical and magnetic fields. And, uh, and you have both in a pen, penning trap. So you can trap these things in this penning trap and then feed them uh, with uh, the electrons. Okay, so um, now uh, what, what, what are they? So he says, now electrical engineering does not let charge disappear, but it does in this multiple, tar multiple toroidal form. Now bear that phrase in mind when I go through uh, what I thought um, maybe the structure of these things. But anyway, uh, but it does in these, this multiple toroidal form. You see, an EVO is a cluster, is one way of thinking of it, of electrons. And you know, and physics says, yeah, well, you can get Cooper pairs at two, that's two electrons, uh, that, uh, those two fermions become a boson. They're obviously something that people might recognize from superconductivity. Uh, muons, which are about 207 times the electron, and maybe tauons that are 3,477 or eight times an electron. Beyond that, they are all just clusters of electrons of a larger size. 
But heck, they rarely go above the hundreds and I see them into the billions worth, no trouble at all. So I'm working with these way upscale class of guys. And then he goes on to say, it enshrouds stuff. This is all written in some of these things on the web. These are his writings that he published. When it enshrouds things, it can allow them to disappear. And it does make atoms disappear in my laboratory uh, work. Well, that's interesting, you know, because when they disappear, I can transport all this stuff through to somewhere else and it reappears. That's teleportation. So it does that very nicely. And I have a sample here uh, from John Hutchison, which was found growing away from his active area here. And I call it the meteor. And I've shared extremely detailed images of this. And it was found near some capacitor. And it's got bits of string and plastic in there. It has large pieces of quartz uh, and other pieces in there. But predominantly, it looks like these kind of iron spheres. And we'll come back to that. Um, those that have seen my work will have found that in many, many of these systems, we find iron crenellated spheres being synthesized. Okay, so uh, moving with that point, he says, Ken Shoulders in 2010 said, it's written in the law. This is the law of science. Um, and he says this in a parrot-like like monotonous voice, so I'll do the same. Charge is conserved, mass is conserved, energy is conserved, E equals MC squared, all hitched together. Wrong, just dead wrong. Because I can take one of these funny little particles and change its charge from actual measurement. This is no hand waving thing. I can measure it with an instrument. I can do it any day you want to. You can change it over a billion to one and it's still and still have it visible. The heck of it is I can still keep reducing the charge to where it becomes an item that walks right through things. Finally, one day it showed up. I was shooting them uh, shooting through metal. It shouldn't be able to transmit that particle charged through that piece of metal. It did. No problem. Violation of physics. Fundamental nasty violation. Now, I'm going to ask a question of the group at this point, because I'm going to spring off that particular point there. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting one Dr. George Egan in 2016 at his flat in Budapest. And he's one of the world's uh, foremost experts on ball lightning, having studied them for a very large amount of time. And uh, he showed me um, uh, various images. And anyway, we became good friends. And I ended up going and doing some experiments in India with him. And in an on and off day, which was most of the days, the second time we were there, the second time I was there, the first time he was there, um, we, we would discuss varying th various things, and he discussed uh, two ball lightning incidences uh, where uh, there were some interesting observations. So in the first one, whether it's a lady or a man, I don't know, but whatever, the person recounting this incident had a ball lightning come into their field of view, whether it came into their building or, or not, that's not important. But in, the, in this first instance he described, uh, he said that the ball lightning came into this field of view and it disassembled and uh, a, a couple of gallons of water came out of it. So let's say uh, that's absolutely in my, that's just mind boggling. Another example was a ball lightning came into this person's field of view and a load of sand came out of it. Now, what do those two things tell you? Uh, anyone got any guesses? Anyone liked it? Tim, would you like to hazard a guess? Oh, you know, I'm not the right person, sir. <laughs> Well, just, just, just imagine you've got a thing that's floating around and the first example is two gallons of water comes out of it. And then the second example is, you know, a, um, a, a load of sand comes out of it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyone like to have guess. a guess? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. What's interesting about that? No? Okay. All right. I'll tell you. When he told me, oh, we've got one. Go on, Ben. What's interesting about those two examples? Ben, you need to unmute your mic and you need to be accepted by the Tim. Got it. All right, you there? Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's something to do with the beach. I mean, you got water and sand. <laughs> no, 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 you're way off. Okay, let me let me answer it. <laughs> but, but at least you put your hand up. I'm, I'm very happy with that. So, I'm um, afraid to try. <laughs> not afraid to try that's good so uh 
uh, maybe this will help you with where I'm going. One example of another ball lightning uh, testimony he had, uh, which you can download these testimonies off his website, was this uh, ball lightning went into like a barrel, like, like you would have storing water coming out of a drain. And it boiled off a large volume of that barrel of water. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that when the ball is going into water, water that is surrounding it is somehow turned to steam, okay? But the water that's moving around in the ball itself, which is able to turn water from the outside into steam, isn't even boiling. It came out as a liquid, right? That's one thing. And again, in the case of the sand, which we know if it's you know, a, a sort of basic silica sand, it might, it might start to uh, sinter at about 300 degrees, 350 degrees. That means it's not at 350 degrees, it's not at 100 degrees centigrade, but it can boil water when it goes into it. And as you'll see in images that I will share, it can actually burrow through concrete. It can burrow through all kinds of uh, refractory materials, these things. The second thing is, so essentially what I'm saying is it's not hot inside, but there is some point between its field of influence outside of the inside, which is so hot that it can boil very quickly and disintegrate matter. The second thing is this, it's floating around. And if, I don't know whether it's in a UK gallon or American gallon, if it's American gallon, I might be right in saying that's at least, if it's two gallons, that's at least eight kilos that's floating around in the air. And if it's a bunch of sand, that's going to have weight as well. So what you can say, given these two examples, is it's not hot inside. In fact, it's suitably not hot so that water doesn't boil. So it might be useful for other things that want to be inside it. It's able to move around and ball lightning is known to actually transport itself through material. I talked about the teleportation effectively. But it's not, the gravity is not able to express itself on the contents of the ball lightning. It loses its mass. mass. It, 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 the, the action of gravity on that mass inside the ball lightning is not affected until the structure that's containing the matter, in one case, the water, and in the other case, uh, um, sand, is it, the, the structure falls apart and then it acts, the gravity can then act on it. So what is this telling you? This is telling you that within a uh, whatever a ball lightning structure is, which Ken Shoulders is saying is related to an exotic vacuum object, whatever that is, is able to shield the mass that's contained within it. It is not anti-gravity, it removes the action of gravity on the thing inside. <laughs> it's not working against gravity, it just stops it working. Okay, all right. So. Uh, I don't know why I put that in there. That slide shouldn't be in there, but uh, we'll go on. What is an Evo? Uh, so there were some other people that are contemporaneously uh, finding similar observations. One was uh, Messiat in Russia, and he called them exons. And he's done a huge body of work. And uh, you should uh, look at his work. And in fact, I think it was in something like 1996, he came to a conference in um, uh, America and he was talking about his ectons and la la la. And I, I, I think it was um, uh, the guy that had bought the patents off Ken. He, he, he said, uh, well, I'm sorry, but Ken Shoulders has already patented this. So, um, uh, you know, you're talking about the same thing as, as exotic vacuum objects. Another person who you should consider, and we are currently um, making a one-to-one -one copy of his uh, work, uh, his, um, uh, collected papers from 1989 to 1999 is one Dr. Takeaki Matsumoto. And he um, essentially, I think in 2001 in fusion technology, he conceded that his ecton, his, his itonic clusters, which were these mesh like structures that uh, were con composed of these itons, uh, which were made of. Um, uh, positrons and electrons bound together with neutrinos and these came together in one coherent body that then formed these mesh-like structures that are able to transport the material. Uh, he said these are probably the same thing as exotic vacuum objects and they are related and the same as uh, ball lightning but he worked with what he called micro ball lightning versions of these itonic clusters. So there's a lot of cross-correlation here.
Now, in 2018, considering a lot of the things that I'd seen on different materials, I came up with this structure for the basic exotic vacuum object. So I believed it had some sort of core that was kind of like a black hole, but not. And this could move up and down depending on the velocity of uh, the toroidal ring that has a, a toroidal and a poloidal uh, component to it. And it produces a vortex into the center. So that's kind of how I could explain many of the observations that I had been sharing from physical observations in experiments. It was a later time that I came across this 1973 patent, uh, which obviously is expired from one Paul Collock. And this is showing uh, from a, basically a simulated lightning strike or whatever. You get the lightning strike, it, it, it forms a, 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 the, the discharge channel. This forms kink instabilities. The kink instabilities form a series of loops and the loops join together into one single torus, which has a multiplication of the current of the original discharge times the number of loops that were captured. And this then forms this structure. It's explained on this slide and you can go and see in a number of presentations and download off our, um, the MFMP's YouTube channel uh, when I'm discussing this. Um, but essentially it has the toroidal current and the poloidal current going in there. And then this produces something akin to a sphere. And he was proposing this for fusion reactors and he was using pressure pulses to keep it in the, in the core of the reactor. And uh, in 1993, December the 12th, I think it was, uh, there was a paper submitted to Journal of Fusion Technology uh, that was published in May uh, 1995, which cites uh, the fact that ball lightning would be the way forward to producing uh, fusion energy, but you would need to make a free floating fireball. And it cites the 1970s work uh, and 1980s work of uh, Paul Collock as, as a way forward. And that was by Jay Roth. Uh, and he, I think he was working for the US Air Force uh, when he was uh, putting that uh, paper together for fusion technology. So uh, this is the plasmac structure, and these are some structures that we've observed on the inside of a ball lightning generator based on uh, the work of Dusty Fusion by Dr. George Eagley. Now, I have a sample in my drawer here, um, which I'm going to refer to next, and it is from 2007 from John Hutchison, and I call it the fracture sample. So here it is. And on this fracture sample, we have a mesh. Now, Ken Shoulders said that these, these structures, they, they form, can form a mesh over a substance. And if, if you do that, and I've described this in other presentations, if you do that, uh, and this is similar to what Matsumoto is talking about, then effectively uh, that is protecting from, from the action of gravity. And we'll come on to that a, a little bit later. But in close uh, examination of this uh, sample under the microscope, I found a series of various quantization levels. Uh, so uh, we have a very small one here. We have, this is actually on a different uh, technology. Um, we have uh, larger ones here and then a bigger one here. And, and as you go up through these different structures uh, and you measure them, this is about 50 microns. So it's hundred microns across. Uh, this one is uh, 200, so it's 400 microns across. So you've got a 100 micron one here, okay? And so if you go back to this one, there's a, there's a, a peak and a trough, a peak and a trough. This is an outy, this is an inny. One's a yin, one's a yang, okay? So this is a half soliton structure here, uh, and it's a magnetic vortex. And in this case, this is a 100 micron diameter. But uh, normally these things are a D for D ratio. Okay, so the diameter of the outer ring uh, is one D, and then the overall structure is a, a, a four D. And uh, here you can see this hundred micron, four hundred micron structure for the next quantization level. And so this is, uh, as I say, this is the, uh, um, uh, the sort of second tier. It's not the second tier, but it's the second tier. Let's call it for this this case. Um, and then uh, the, the, the one up from there, we have, this is the 200, the 400 micron one. So the 400 micron one here, let, let's add these around here. And um, this has a series of these. You don't see the full outside because where this overall structure has crashed into this aluminium and it's sweeping this material around, um, uh, you, you, you don't see the full radii here. But anyway, uh, so you can see here that this is a, a kind of top view. And uh, we have an overall radius here 
of around about, well, this is 1500, but again, from the side profile, it's not sweeping the full radius. Uh, and so you end up with something that's 1600 microns. So this is 1 1.6 millimeters across. And this is a three tier fractal structure. And um, it has this, in each stage, this is a D4D ratio, D4D ratio, D4D ratio, D4D ratio. And this is interesting. This is produced in 2007. And um, I think I've got some videos here. Uh, this is from uh, Bostick and Nardi's work. I think this is published in 1970s, but uh, um, they actually started their work on what they called condensed plasmoids in uh, nine, uh, 1948. And they first published, I think, in 1956 or 57. And these are some of their micrographs. And you can see the structure here. And if you look down the bottom here, it says, note the hole formed by pinched electrons at the center of a large D4D ring, D4D ring. So th th this is one of those rings. And you get these sort of black, white, black, white, black, white uh, sections around, uh, similar to the kind of structures we have here. So I hypothesize that the structure, therefore, um, oh, we've got a, the, the light moving around this. You can see the, the subunits of how it's uh, manipulated the material on the aluminium here. So this isn't spinning round, but the individual things could be spinning around. But the actual things themselves are fixed in location, which is a bit weird to think about. But anyway, that's, that's the physical evidence. OK, so um, this is the structure that I came up with. Um, and it is, uh, if you can imagine, uh, this is the small unit. This is our 100 micron uh, 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 overall diameter. Uh, this is our uh, 400 micron, and this is our uh, 1, 1.6 millimeter structure. And so uh, you can imagine that these have a magnetic structure to them, uh, and you'll find out later that it, it appears that they have a suppressed one or other pole. So you can have a suppressed north pole or a suppressed south pole. And so they can magnetically link this way. And then they, uh, um, th they become similar to uh, um, uh, Wheeler's, uh, uh, what do they call them, uh, Guillaume's, which he published, I think, in 1954. Wheeler worked with Bostick, uh, I think, on, on the H-bomb. Certainly Wheeler worked on the H-bomb, and, and he was Feynman's uh, tutor. Uh, and uh, it was much later that I came across Wheeler's work, which looks remarkably similar to this. And uh, Wheeler says that it has a gravitational moment that goes through the center. And uh, that would be the case for each of the subquanta. Um, so are they bound together gravitationally? I don't know. What is gravity? What is the thing of magnetism? Anyway, there's definitely magnetic moments in there, and we'll look at that. Um, and if I can find out why I've not got the material on that slide, I don't know. But <laughs> this is actually some things by Bostick here, and uh, it's in Scientific American, the link's there, but for some reason I'm not seeing the images here. But this is something he published in 1957. He, he's saying basically, if we look at these condensed plasmoids, and uh, we look at how they self-organize, they explain everything from the microcosm all the way up to galaxies. Uh, and uh, he says the same phenomena could explain all, all scales of, of uh, um, self-organization in the universe. Okay, so now um, subsequent to me publishing this work, there was this uh, work published by the Nuclear Research uh, uh, Cent uh, uh, sorry, Nuclear the National Research Nuclear University Moscow uh, Engineering Physics Institute by Bogdanovich et al. And this is video recordings of long-lived plasmoids near objects exposed to remote and direct effects of high current pinch discharges. So they had a water flow and they were uh, uh, discharging down onto a metal plate. So you had water in there, you will have had OH, you will have had H in there. So you would have some protons with this discharge. And so you have everything you need to create a kind of ball lightning structures. And what they found was they found these tor toroids moving around on the metal surface two days after the experiment and glowing two days after the experiment. And when I uh, was uh, uh, published this, a person that um, worked in the US military said that when they were doing electric, electron beam treatment of landing gear, it was formally classified, but they were finding these glowing spots on the material, uh, the, this aluminium. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, he went back to the people that were working there at that time and they were retired. He said, look, this, this work's come out of uh, Russia you know, they're finding these things and they're recording them two days after the discharge. Um, 
you know, what was the situation with those things that you used to brush off the landing gear with a wire brush? Uh, did you investigate them? And they said, yes, yes. And we found that they actually existed for up to two months going around and glowing on the metal, which I think is rather interesting. And in that same work, they found that these toroids could group themselves into crystal-like lattice mesh-like structures. And uh, here's a phrase from this paper, a stream of particles, presumably electrons, which causes air to glow, is emitted from the surface. After 10 to 20 seconds, this stream is formed into a set of several rings, five or six of the same diameter, which rotate around both their own and common axis parallel to the plane horizontal. And they also showed in this paper how something could pass through other material and be observed on the other side of the material. So there's something that's neutral that they call the body. So you've got the plasmoid and then you've got the body. You've got some neutral component that's able to pass through solid material. OK, now, before this was published, we actually published this uh, as an observation uh, from a water spark discharge circuit that was on ignitionsecrets.com. And uh, so here, here we have this little glowing thing down here. And this looks remarkably like this structure here that was captured uh, a couple of years later uh, from our publication of that observation. Um, in, this was published in May 2019. Okay. And they are saying that in this paper that this might be the sort of structure of ball lightning. And I'm minded to agree because you have a toroid and the toroids are grouping together. And uh, there we go. So, and this is not good if I'm going to be losing. Uh, slides here. I think it's meant to be connected to another computer. Let, let me just get that connected and see why why um, I'm losing slides here. Oh dear. <laughs> I might not get, be able to get that back and it's okay. We'll just have to lose some slides, won't we? <laughs> okay. All right. If we do that, we do. Uh, let's skip that. That's in Pro Project Amaza, uh, uh, Omar. Um, okay, so in, in uh, Bogdanovich's work, uh, he explained these toroidal structures uh, by using the uh, um, Dirac monopole derived structure. It's a monopole like structure um, that was proposed uh, in 2008 by the Russian Vizhnevsky. And essentially, electrons are pulled into a uh, vortex and they are forced to cohere, they form opposite sides and they become Cooper pairs, so they become bosons, and they come down to the magnetic core. And in the magnetic core, they spin around at a minimum distance, and some of them get eventually sprayed out. And this forms a structure which uh, has two different types, depending on the spin, uh, 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 whether it's uh, left or right spin, and uh, they produce uh, the north and south uh, pseudo-magnetic monopole structures. Okay. Now, um, there's a guy called Leonid Oritskev, he's another Russian, and he did exploding foils like uh, went an Irian in 1922. Uh, he did this in a water chamber, so you will get uh, HHO being formed instantaneously in there. So again, you have a high intensity electric discharge in water, in this case with titanium foil, and this will actually produce um, uh, exotic vacuum objects uh, in abundance. And what he found was, and this is a mirror above, so you could look down as well as at directly, he found that uh, they produced ball lightning outside of the explosion chamber. And these ball lightning would also break down into small ball lightning. So they would, they would, it would break up. So whatever it was, if you can imagine it's a load of meshes of these things, they would then dissipate into little micro ball lightning. But what he also did is at a distance of 0.7 of a meter, he had some iron 57 foil and it, he had them orthogonal. He had them 90 degrees to each other, 0.7 meters one way, like that way, and another one 0.7 meters that way with iron 57 foil in both places. And then he put a normal magnet on the back, one with uh, the north on the magnet and that one with the south on the magnet. And then he used uh, NMR uh, nuclear magnetic resonance to see uh, against a control which was in another room without a magnet on it, uh, if there was any change in the fine uh, uh, magnetic moment of the nuclei of the iron 57 foil. And he found for the north, the one that had the north side of a magnet put to the back of it, uh, that it shifted one way, and the one that had the south the, uh, on it, it shifted the other way. And this showed that two types of these structures were flying into uh, the iron 57 emitted 
through the water, through the plastic chamber, through the aluminium chamber, and across 0.7 meters of air, and then bind into the iron 57 nucleus. So this is a pseudo magnetic monopole uh, that he was collecting here. So what can EVOs do? Well, I call them the God's toolbox. I've been calling them that since uh, early 2017. I went public with it, I think last year, or maybe earlier this year, but I say little God, uh, because when these were used before, people could pretend that they, they were gods. They could have control over the weather, earthquakes, volcanoes. Uh, they could make things fall down, disintegrate, and so on. So if you if you had one of the tools from this toolbox, you could set yourself up as a god. And I believe that the you know I believe that people have been using these uh, at pre Ice Age, and probably. Uh, people can uh, use them soon in the future, I hope. But anyway, let's hope they don't pretend they're gods. So um, uh, they can shield mass charge and inertia leading to teleportation. I've already talked about that. Uh, bore holes in anything. Uh, they can form coherent, magnetically organized, fluidized electrons. And they can synthesize matter, transmute matter, and dis dissemble matter into light and leptons. So this is literally the power of creation and decreation. And it is through exotic vacuum objects of various scales that you can, uh, uh, the, the, the universe is continually able to uh, rebirth itself. And so you don't need any big bang uh, when you have these in place. So here's Ken Shoulders examples of boring holes. So this is through uh, an Evo strike on silicon carbide grain coated uh, uh, on a thick aluminium foil. And then uh, this is an uh, exit side of an EV, EV strike on silicon carbide grain coated on a uh, 0.001 inch uh, thick uh, aluminium foil. So you can see it's gone straight through that. Here it is burrowing its way through aluminium oxide. And the interesting thing is Ken Shoulders showed that you can actually cover something like aluminium oxide with paraffin wax, which melts at about 53 degrees centigrade. And the, it would come through, say, say, for instance, aluminium, which is melting at 700 and whatever degrees it is. It would come through, hit the paraffin wax, and it would just spread out a load of aluminium atoms in a thin layer, or aluminium oxide atoms. So it wasn't hot when it was doing this. It was the opposite of hot. <laughs> um, it was able to burrow through you know, aluminium oxide. You're, you're having to go over 2,070 degrees or 2,100 degrees, something like that to go through here. If you're thinking about this thermally, it's not thermal. Now, look at the comparison between what you're seeing on this page for an exotic vacuum object burrowing through these materials and one that is boring through uh, these brick walls, these concrete walls. So this is, this is a concrete base and the, the ball lightning was trying to find uh, the reinforced concrete. And this is coming through a wall and it was uh, finding electric wires and so on. It blew all the electric wires out of the, the wall here. Now look at the comparison. This is from Dr. George Eagley's uh, photos. Here's, here's the one of the ball lightning uh, coming through the wall. And here is the structure uh, coming out of uh, uh, the silicon carbide. So you, you have a very, very similar uh, phenomenon going on, but on very large, uh, this, is, this is only 20, 20 micron uh, diameter here for the hole. And this is, I think you, th this one's rather large. Uh, you can see here, it's, it's physically large. And again, you've got a vortical, vortical pattern of carbon scarring on the wall here. This one's really rather massive. I think you could, you could probably put your leg in this hole. So you can see the different kind of scales we're talking about here. Now, what I'm showing you here, is an experiment called the Vega Valley, and it's from our uh, Vega experiments. And this is from Henk in uh, Holland. And we have a, another collaborating scientist in Canada called Dave. Henk found that with two brass plates on another brass plate, uh, you would get ball lightning forming in the center. These would then wet together. And I've shown many examples in this series of work where they wet together. And on the flip side of this, we get these channels, which look almost like a um, woodworm uh, going through the materials. Uh, and uh, I have shared uh, unimaginably beautiful scanning electron microscopy images of these structures. In fact, I have an image on my wall over here that you can see maybe there, 
which is uh, a structure there. And on, on the wall behind me, this, this is a, a magnetic iron uh, crenellated sphere that's found in these channels. And I believe that is the core of large, core of large ball lightning that gets synthesized out of the matter that it captures. But anyway, this forms a magnetic fluid and it arranges itself like ferrofluid. And even ferrofluid has magnetic cell units, but it, rather than the ferrofluid being the solid bit or liquid bit rather in the channels, the liquid bit in the channels is the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the electron condensate that, that bleeds out from uh, the ball lightning that is being uh, uh, charge pumped on the top. Uh, and uh, it, it forms these channels. And the, the substructure of this is just un unbelievably breathtaking. You can see some incredible images on our channel. And it's, it's highly organized with magnetic or orientation. It's synthesizing diamond. Uh, and uh, some just, it's just, this is probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever had to study in my life. Um, but it's one thing that ball lightning can do. Now, another thing uh, we were doing some, I think it was in 2015 or 16, we were doing some experiments uh, uh, with nickel and hydrogen. Uh, this is known to produce these same uh, birdie type structures. And uh, we had an event uh, in one of our experiments, which we called um, uh, signal. And this is the spectrum that we got out of it. And you can see that it goes down to the very low soft X-rays. And uh, we found that uh, by further analysis, Bob Higgins found that 93.98% of the me measured samples were below 255 kV. And uh, when, when uh, Matsumoto is discussing how when these exotic vacuum objects blow up, he's saying you see these level of energy being produced. Um, and similarly, this is hot off the press. Following on from our work, the uh, All Russia Plasma in, uh, Institute uses uh, a Tesla uh, um, discharge or another type of discharge. But in this case, I think this is, I think this might have a liquid chamber here. It's produced this ball lightning here. And in their experiment, you can see here, they've got this X123 uh, X-ray uh, uh, spectrometer. And they are pointing into their source here. And you have T uh, at 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and 60 seconds. And you can see when it starts off, you get these very discrete lines. And then you've got an, a whole series of discrete lines here. And, and then it ends up as a very smooth structure, which you can see here. And uh, this is very similar to what we observed here, with the majority of them uh, not going above 255 uh, kV. And um, the interesting thing is that um, as the thing progresses, uh, so you, you've got to 15 seconds here and 25 seconds, the, the thing changes color. And what's happening here is you are getting um, a different elements synthesized up to a point where you get to this point where, in my view, the outer sheath is coherent and you just get whatever's going on inside or, or at the center of the double layer um, it, 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 all that comes out is a, is a perfect uh, um, spread spectrum of uh, uh, x-rays. You don't see anything uh, discrete. But um, yeah, so the majority of them are 255. And in fact, he studied um, these peaks and he found all of the usual elements you get synthesized from ball lightning and so on. So on an aluminium target, he was creating up to iron, for instance, uh, but he was creating sodium and, and uh, silicon and so forth, these other elements. So, um, uh, so you will see this in ball lightning, you will see different colors in ball lightning, and you will also see this in so-called UFOs and things that are actually using this technology. They will have different colors and it's because of the level of energization uh, uh, get reaching to a coherent matter state. And when it's in the coherent matter state, um, he says that uh, you get UV emissions a million times more than you do when it's not coherent. And at this point, uh, you, you're, you're getting soft X-rays and, and uh, very large amounts of UV. And this ionizes the air around the ball lightning uh, or anything using this technology. And also, um, it, whatever goes on inside this, you're just going to get this spectra, sped, spread spectrum of soft X-rays. And so you will need to coat your aircraft with uh, um, material 
uh, that is able to prevent this ionization ra uh, radiation from damaging the, the occupants. And so you, you'll probably find, uh, based on how uh, ball lightning and exotic vacuum objects work, that people that are exposed to ball lightning or anything using this technology will get burns, they will get, uh, um, uh, they will get suntanned, uh, and some things will degrade. These, these are the more benign problems uh, with this technology as a means of propulsion. Uh, but anyway, um, the other thing is when this is spinning around, this is a ball lightning, a plasmoid that's being ejected here, you get this oscillation here. So, uh, and, and this is, there's a guy called Mikhail Solin in 1992, he's a Russian, and he published a way of uh, generating direct less electricity and energy from this by having uh, a, an induction coil around and capturing the power that is produced by the spinning uh, ball, uh, the coherent matter structure. Here's the coherent matter structure that, like I said, is hot off the press. This was last Wednesday, and this is coming into the quartz, and the quartz is like melting at over 1700 degrees. And you can see that it's just eating out very large channels in, in the quartz. It's consuming the material, and it also produces these kind of uh, periodic weird tracks. And, and when the, the uh, structure dies, it blows up and leaves the material that it was carrying. And we've observed these things in a number of different experiments that, that we have done. And I, I'm, I'm told that in the next few days, I will get uh, some uh, details, uh, uh, hopefully, on what the uh, elemental analysis is of these uh, impacts. So uh, I'm going to run through, there's many, many different uh, presentations I've done on matter manipulation. I'm going to quickly run through some. So I'm going to start with this uh, Kepri here. So um, so what we have here is, is car. This is the chi energy, the spirit energy. Um, this, this is effectively, it, you will find, in my view, is uh, relic neutrinos or synthesized cold neutrinos, which are the equivalent of relic neutrinos. And, and this goes through the... Uh, the symbol here of uh, regeneration and so forth. Um, here, here you have your emitter for your uh, exotic vacuum objects, and here you have your ball lightning structure uh, that is formed. Uh, the ball lightning here, this is the, the first time it was imaged in China. You can go and see this on um, uh, Wikipedia. And I've done a presentation where I explained exactly how starting from nitrogen and oxygen in the air, you synthesize all of the other elements observed in the spectrum. And you see these same uh, observations in areas like uh, the outback in Australia and in Hestalen, where, where you don't have the ball lightning uh, caused as a result of a lightning strike. It's just, it just manifests itself in the air, but you still see these uh, kind of colors going on. And the colors will change uh, depending on the level of coherence. Uh, and as it dies off, it, it, will, it will change its color as I've just shown you uh, in the experiments uh, uh, done at the All Plasma Institute by, uh, um, by uh, the researcher in Russia. Okay, so I've done a whole bunch of presentations here. You're going to look at these in your own time. So Stanford presentation, that was the first time I really talked about ball lightning. Uh, then that was at the beginning of 2017. Um, and then uh, the UFOs over Histalin uh, explained, uh, I've done that one, and also ball lightning and coherent nuclear transmutation uh, here. And here's your fuel in the air, it's basically oxygen and nitrogen with argon, and this is predominantly why we use these uh, residual air, uh, which will contain some water mo moisture as well uh, in our Vega experiments. But in one of our experiments, uh, and we might come back to this later in the presentation, this was a Mars gas, which is produced uh, using sound on vibrating plates. This produces cohering uh, yin-yang vortices, and I've described this in detail. Uh, and uh, this produces these uh, tracks. Anyway, when the gas is burned, uh, it produces coherent matter. This is uh, similar to Brown's gas. The coherent matter then produces what look like eddy currents, but anyway, they're, they're, they're a yin-yang structure as well. It consumes the matter here and it slams it down here. Uh, so this is a macro structure. On this macro structure, you have a micro one, which is up here, which is the same kind of structure, but smaller and off a, a 90 degree angle to the overall plane of the overall structure here. And then in one side of this, the slam down side, as I call it, uh, the, not the one that eats out, the one that gets slammed down, we have this structure here. So this brassy, goldy area here is mostly copper. And in fact, it's copper oxide in the, what they, I call these co cobblestones. And this brings us back to Tesla's snowballs running down a mountain. These are, uh, as I said, in the Yurutskiev work, when the ball lightning breaks up, it breaks up into subquanta that are themselves self-similar structures based on the larger structure. 
and they are also ball lightning and down to micro ball lightning and nano ball lightning. Anyway, this is micro ball lightning and it's run around the surface of the copper here like the Bogdanovich work probably after the experiment was over and it's consumed the oxide on the surface because oxygen is highly paramagnetic uh, and uh, it, it likes to eat that and it takes 216 oxygen and is fused to make sulfur here and you've got the reactions down here and the energy yield so if you take oxygen 16 oxygen 16 infused to sulfur 32 you end up with 16.539 million electron volts and uh, so that's what we see synthesized on these snowballs on the cobblestones so this is my little nod to tesla and so this is showing that a mars of gas this is 100 proof that a, a form of oxyhydrogen gas can uh, transmute matter and with the collected te technologies of coherent nuclear transmutation i believe that we can uh, cause uh, any planet that is uninhabitable to be inhabitable by terraforming and oxygen is the most common element in the Earth's crust, silicon is the next most, and, and so on. And these are the elements that this technology preferentially likes to synthesize in the lab. And so uh, you do not need, you do not need, you do not need a big bang, you do not need supernova, you do not need all of these things to create all of the elements we see on Earth. It could have started up as one lump of iron and had lots of lightning strikes and over a period of time, you, uh, along with the cold neutrino flux from the cosmos, you would have ended up by producing a crust and ending up with life on Earth. It's just, it's always going to happen if the conditions are right. So this was um, uh, interaction of titanium uh, dope, uh, uh, treated with a Mars gas for a moment and PTFE. And on it, we saw this crystal structure in this explosion here. And uh, on examining this crystal structure, we had these <clears throat> uh, cones and rods. And when we look at the cones and rods, uh, the t the, this is pure titanium, this, this uh, uh, open dendritic structure, which uh, uh, Solin calls in his 1992 pattern, a quantum coherent instantaneous formation of crystals. And um, th these magnetically uh, and orthogonally aligned structures that are growing out of the pure titanium are titanium plus um, uh, carbon, titanium plus beryllium, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. Brilliant. Anyway, two alphas and, and, uh, and titanium plus carbon. So you end up with um, uh, essentially nickel and then iron and then chromium. OK, so uh, you have nickel down the bottom, then you have iron and then you have chromium and then you have titanium and then it just it, it, it has a carbon nanotube coming out the end. And th this is basically the exotic vacuum object has a payload of titanium and has a, a certain amount of carbon. Uh, which is extracted from the PTFE, and uh, um, it's dumping that down. And based on the intensity of the vortex of the, the soliton of the exotic vacuum object, it layers down different elements until it runs out of material and it just dumps its payload of carbon that it has left. And so this, this is called an alpha conjugate nuclear synthesis, synthesis from exotic vacuum objects. And we've also observed it in, in the fluorine as well. So we end up by getting sodium-23 and aluminium-27 or whatever. You get alpha conjugates on, on fluorine as well. Uh, this is a, a tungsten welding rod. A lot of people talk about tungsten being uh, um, torn to shreds by uh, the uh, material, um, by, by oxyhydrogen gas. Well, I thought no one's ever done an analysis of the fumes coming off. So I asked uh, Dr. George Eagley here, this is this is show who's... Uh, sponsored some of uh, the work we've done. This, this is Dr. Roy Shinamaza, uh, and this is the experiment. This is a close-up on the experiment. And he's got a vacuum cleaner here with one of these face masks we're all very familiar with these days. And we're collecting the fumes that are coming off so I can analyze not, not just what the transmutation is on the rod, but also I can analyze the transmutation that's uh, been captured in the dust particles that have come off. This has never been, been done before. It was the first time it was done. This is the material to start with. It was essentially just thorium doped uh, tungsten with a little bit of oxygen. And on the surface, we get all of the usual suspects. Uh, calcium gets produced most. And why do we get calcium produced in every spot? Well, the reason is, is because if you fission uh, calcium, you end up with preferentially uh, 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 an element plus calcium being synthesized. Uh, one, isotope 180 is a rare isotope. So you don't see much of the uh, titanium there. But anyway, um, uh, there is titanium, but it's just not so significant. You get calcium coming out. So uh, this is what we're finding. And calcium was found in many other people that have observed this. Again, here's another sample looking at the areas. 
Here is our yin yang structure. And in fact, the whole three, the three structures together here makes the OM. Um, and you will see this on our ultra experiments if you go and look those up. Um, but anyway, th this is the soliton that you have here. And the, the half loop soliton could create some instability over here anyway. Um, and, and in here, in very specific structures, you have synthesis of different elements. And I've gone into it there. But again, uh, you have this carbon film, and this is something that Matsumoto observed in a huge degree. Here in the filter, we see the same transmutation products that we saw on the surface of the uh, tungsten. So uh, this is confirming that the material that's blown off because of these extremely energetic reactions. So if we, if we go uh, up, is it gonna go back? Uh, yeah, okay, here. So from this uh, fissioning of say uh, tungsten 184, we're getting uh, calcium 48 and xenon 136. And uh, they have 85 million electron volts. Plus, the, the, the atomic volume of calcium alone is twice that of the atom of tungsten, let alone the xenon, which is far larger still. So it's not surprising that when we look at, at the materials captured in the, the um, filter of the face mask, we see transmutation uh, vast tr chunks of material that have been shredded. And this is, it's not melting, it's not. Uh, turning to gas, it's literally blowing it up. That's what's happening. And, it, and the, the exotic vacuum objects go partially into the metal, they transmute it and they just cause it to explode. Okay, so you can see that all there. Here's uh, on indium. And uh, indium was funny because it melts at 156 point whatever degrees C, 156.6 degrees C. And uh, uh, humorously, um, uh, the, the gas is supposed to be very hot, and, but anyway. Uh, and on the indium, we see these uh, different structures forming. Here's a wonderful X, which is relevant uh, to how the magnetic structures form. But anyway, we won't go into that. Um, you see these eruptions of the typical elements that we see synthesized from any heavier element. This is the carbon film uh, that you see. This is more carbon film and silicon and so on. So uh, these are all the elements you want to see. So that's talking about transmutation. And here we go. Here's our scarab beetle. And according to the Egyptians, the scarab beetle is creation, nuclear synthesis, in my view, regeneration, according to the Egyptians, I would say repair and stabilize, uh, transformation, reorganization, uh, uh, or transformation could be uh, uh, just moving teleportation or actual propulsion and renewal reset. Okay, so we are now on to um, uh, propulsion. And uh, I wanna talk about something that Tesla Nikola Tesla said in uh, 1911, and to bring him up to the uh, current day, he's always got a grim expression on. So this one was captured from some AI. So he's been colorized and given a nice smile there. So uh, this is Tesla smiling because uh, so I think his, his uh, technology is, is practically going to be realized in the public soon when people understand uh, what, what I'm hopefully talking about here. Um, rather than being a little, little glum. Um, anyway, so how about aerial navigation, Dr. Tesla was asked. He considered for a moment or two and then replied with great deliberation. The application of this principle will give the world a flying machine unlike anything that has ever been suggested before. It will have no planes, no screw propellers or devices of any kind hitherto used. It will be small and compact, excessively swift, and above all, perfectly safe in the greatest storm. It can be built of any size and can carry any weight that may be desired. Now, it's never mentioned. It's never mentioned. Now, uh, we, we do know, we do know that, uh, well, it's, it, we're led to believe that Werner von Braun was working at Los Alamos in 1937 on uh, Tesla's anti-gravity flying machines uh, that he's describing here that he first discussed in the 1890s, I believe. Um, uh, but following on from the Second World War, Winston Bostick, who I've mentioned before, he was trying to use electrical discharges over a magnetic field, which we all know uh, causes light to spin. But anyway, um, he, he was trying to do this to convert the H-bomb into domestic fusion. And that's how he came to discover condensed plasmoids, which was the name he gave to it, which eventually came, it became exotic vacuum objects, which is probably closer to iotonic clusters. Uh, but in 1958, he proposed that he could produce a device using some of his learning that would uh, fly at two and a half million miles per hour. And uh, when we look at the speed of light and compare this to this, uh, it comes out at 0.376% uh, of the speed of light. 
um, which uh, uh, doesn't sound a lot, it's much less than 1%, but it would allow us to reach Mars in about 15 to 20 hours. So that's what he was pro proposing in 1958. Okay, so uh, you can go and have a look at that in your own time. I have this Russian transcript that I found in 2017 when it was published on the CIA's archive on the reading room. Uh, and it was from uh, an interview in 1992, and it was with some Russian scientists. And again, I, I, I got the transcript, which I painstakingly did from the very bad uh, image that's on the CIA's website. But anyway, he's saying, um, we are talking about extracting the inner energy of matter. Now, remember what I said about exotic vacuum objects, they can tear matter apart, they can reduce it to light and leptons. So we can extract the inner energy of matter. Uh, we can take those, those uh, up and down quarks and we can make them into um, uh, uh, you know, light and leptons. And le well, leptons we might be interested in are cold neutrinos, or they might be electron. They might be uh, electrons themselves. Its principal elements are a uh, closed superconductor and a control system. What is a closed superconductor? Well, this could be a toroid, which has a superconducting ring. This looks like a plasma. This looks like a an exotic vacuum object. Okay. Well, anyway, this is for terrestrial needs. But the electron accelerator connected to the circuit turns uh, the converter into a space propulsor. Well, we might find out how that occurs. Using it, one can reach Alpha Centauri uh, and return back to Earth in twelve years. So, what would you need to go do that journey? Well, I think it's four point seven light years away. Anyway, they say that the energy concealed in one kilogram of iron is quite sufficient for an interstellar journey. Uh, and I, I believe if you do the maths, that's, that's correct. And in order to achieve that, one would need to travel at 80% of the speed of light. Hold that in mind. What this would mean is using this technology that was said to be possible in 1992, uh, you would be able to reach Mars in between four and six minutes. Uh, and then, I'm going to refer to this 2013 patent. You can go and see my reviews of this on, on uh, um, my blog at remoteview.icu. But anyway, it's systems and methods for generating coherent matter wave beams. And example applications for coherent matter wave beams may include single bath thermal extraction. This is grabbing heat from the far field and bringing it to your, yourself locally or vice versa. Uh, this is how you would create weather systems and how you would uh, trigger things at a distance. Um, uh, mat matter wave projectiles and missiles, and uh, we've synthesized uh, these projectiles and missiles to a degree in our Vega experiments, and I shared those in my Azizi presentation. Uh, directed energy weapons, again, the same thing. Matter wave optics and cloaking, so this is how you'd make, for instance, a Tom Hawk cruise missile look like a fairly crummy plane, which would probably go in and out of visual appearance as, as, as the... Uh, the, the interaction fields were masked to some degree. But anyway, matter wave emission and propulsion, and propulsion. Matter wave solitons, matter wave solitons. This is what we are talking about. High energy collision and high precision, optics and so on, atomic clocks. Anyway, matter wave solitons. Um, uh, essentially, um, when they are describing how they make these matter wave solitons that yield all these and this coherent matter waves, they literally have a spike and they have a high discharge and they put it through a magnetic field. They use the Ironhoff bomb effect to uh, and, and little, little chambers to cohere the matter to produce the, the coherent matter wave. They are describing a Kenneth Radford Shoulders exotic vacuum object discharge unit, which, by the way, is the same as the Tesla's death ray from the 1930s. Uh, so uh, it is the same thing and it produces coherent matter. And here are some examples of coherent matter produced in our experiments. This was observed on uh, using polarized light because these things are incredibly magnetic. And as they go through materials, we've observed that they can live in the materials for an extended period of time. So they're either modifying the materials or they're leaving a subunit of themselves in the materials that's highly magnetic. And as the light goes in there, it changes its polarization. So you see a ghost of where it's traveled in metal. Here is uh, three frames or four frames of a coherent matter wave beam, which we have produced in, uh, Dave Boutier produced in a uh, Vega experiment. And uh, this is the dead coherent matter wave. And uh, you see the same kind of intertwining structures that you see on the uh, vibrator plate in water and in the plasma chamber. And this is again by Kemp uh, in a Baker experiment. 
And this is diamond. This is a diamond uh, structure. Uh, this is the start of the wave and the end of the overall wave. And this would be, in my view, a coherent matter mesh and so on. Anyway, moving on. Th these, these, if, you, if you didn't want this bullet coming to you at one tenth of the speed of light made of diamond, uh, you'd probably want to get out of the way. So uh, propulsion. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can think about getting propulsion. Ejection of mass, mass rectification, traction, and dark matter distortion. Okay, now um, uh, everyone knows about ejection of mass. This is how a rocket goes up in the air. Mass rectification is talked about by Ken Shoulders. I won't go into it. He, he published a good pa paper on, on that, but it is using exotic vacuum, vacuum objects. I'm going to be focusing on traction and dark matter distortion. Um, and, and these are the two areas in which uh, this propulsion method is working. Now, our target is uh, uh, the speed of light, but it may be above that. But let's just put it at the speed of light. OK, so uh, Eric Davis was commissioned uh, in October 2001 and he reported in May 2003 to find out anyone in the world that knew anything about ball lightning or related technologies. And he came back and said the first new concept is atmospheric maser caviton. OK, uh, and so maser is a microwave laser. This is coherent ma matter. This will be the same kind of family of technology. The second concept is based on electromagnetic vortex plasmoids generated by micro discharge devices uh, and sustained by quantum vacuum energy. I'm not so sure about the quantum vacuum energy. I don't think it's necessary. We could, one, one could argue that. But anyway, uh, the micro discharge devices uh, this is, he's talking about Ken Shoulder's work. And then the third one is this concept which was done in the 1950s and 60s by the Air Force. And it's classified under this code B310 USC 130. And this code is for space and aerospace. So uh, th this, this is what that we're talking about. This is the technology that they're using. Now, how can we get to the kind of speeds that we, we want to achieve? Well, this is from Zatalepin and Baranov. These are two Russian uh, scientists that I collaborate with. And this is a natural ball lightning. This is a synthesized ball lightning with a, um, uh, a, a laser induced. And the, you can see the red shift and the blue shift on the natural ball lightning and the red shift and the blue shift on, on the synthesized ball lightning. This is because the velocity of the spinning of the ball lightning is so high. And in this case, it's calculated to be 100,000 kilometers a second. And on this one, it's calculated to be 40,000 kilometers a second. So bearing in mind that, that the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers a, a second, the, 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 this, the, this uh, ball lightning outside is spinning at one third of the speed of light. So very, very re relativistic speeds uh, going on here. And so I want to talk about magnetic fields uh, because I don't know how much time I've got left, but or where have I got any time left? But uh, <laughs> I'm getting to the juicy bit now. So uh, how am I doing, Tim? Sorry. Well, you're doing well, actually. You can and you can cut into the Q and A session if you want. So okay, and that, that's kind of what you're doing, right? That's the reason that we do such a long Q and A session because a lot of folks run over. So I would say go for it. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, essentially, if you're looking at neuron depolarization, you're talking about 0.5 picotesla. Earth's magnetic field is uh, 50 microteslas. Um, coming down to uh, something that can lift a car, that's one tesla. If you're coming down to something that is a laboratory, uh, sorry, research MRI scanners, seven to, if you go and have a, te I had an MRI scanner in 2000, scan in 2019. That's up to three Teslas, and they say remove everything metal on your body, otherwise it's going <laughs> to grab onto the magnet. Um, the, the largest pulse field created in the lab ever, which destroyed the equipment that made it, was 730 Teslas. The 97 Teslas is the largest field, uh, pulsed field created in a lab, which didn't destroy the equipment that made it. The recent uh, magnets um, from uh, MIT, which they're planning uh, and saying is going to be a great advancement to fusion technology, I think they're around about the five to seven Tesla or six set Tesla range. And these are sort of permanent superconducting magnets. And so that was hailed as a great achievement. Hold that kind of figure in mind. Like the, the, the biggest kind of permanent magnet that we can create as humans today is, is in that kind of order of magnitude. When Ken Shoulders is talking about propulsion, he says, like on the subject of uh, gravity, I don't give a hoot about gravity as long as there's a source of propulsion. Propulsion is as fundamental as you can get. It's controllable gravity, directional control over any force you want. Sure, you can liken it to gravity, but I'll take propulsion any day. Now, 
Lutz Yeitner uh, is a German guy, and he's looked at what he calls condensed plasmoids. You can go and have a, his look, look at his uh, work. I think it's condensedplasmoids.com. Uh, he's done a fantastic study. He's found that in the smaller type of exotic vacuum objects, which he calls condensed plasmoids after Winston Bostick, he found that at 9.2 kiloamp, uh, the uh, magnetic fields are 50 million Teslas. 50 million Teslas. The magnetic pressure caused by this in condensed plasmoids can exceed two times 10 to the 21 Pascals, which is five orders of magnitude higher than in our sun's core. The results, this results in nuclear density in the range of pulsars, which is a form of neutron stars. Due to the intrinsic current of condensed plasmoids, they will exhibit pseudo ferromagnetic behavior even at high temperatures. Okay, so these produce magnetic fields to die for. Now I'm going to quickly go over another scientific paper. So I don't know if this is going to work. Um, just give me a second here. Uh, and I see if I've got it here. File, open. Uh, okay. uh, because this paper was sent to me yesterday morning by the guys at Sapphire uh, and their uh, one of their colleagues. And he sent it to me because he goes, oh, look, someone's discovered Evos. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, yeah, they're catching up. <laughs> and this is some major, major laboratories here uh, all around the world. So, um, so I just want to give you something that's like so up to date, you know, when's, when, Wednesday is the most up to date thing uh, that, that I've given you in this presentation. Uh, but uh, this is pretty, pretty darn up to date. So uh, let me just find this here. And it is here because I think you'll like what I have to show. Now, um, I don't know. Can I get this up there? Can I just get it? Let me go up there now. Okay. Let me see. Can you find? There we go. Yeah, I, I can see it now. Okay, so the, 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 what, what I'm actually showing here is a bunch of coherent matter wave beams from another presentation uh, and so on. But anyway, we won't go into that. This is, this is the paper we're talking about, and it's called Dynamics of Moving Electron Vortices uh, and Magnetic Ring in Laser Plasma. Uh, so in two-dimensional geometry, so basically you've got a bunch of top Chinese universities. You've got Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. You've got a top university in uh, Japan, in the UK and uh, so forth, so, uh, and Glasgow there, okay. Um, the structure appears as an expanding magnetic ring with an internal magnetic field up to 1000 Tesla. The moving velocity can be as large as 0.2 of the speed of light, okay. Now, what they did here, they simulated some, something with an, uh, a relativistic laser plasma they, they synthesized by using a pulse from a, um, uh, a laser, and then they simulated it using, I think, the largest supercomputer in the world. And they came up with something that's absolutely identical for the stuff that I've been sharing for a number of years in a wide range of physical experiments that people mocked early on. And effectively, uh, if I can drag this up there, is it going to let me drag it up there? Oh, what, what is my, where, where, how am I getting onto this page? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh it's because I'm full frame, isn't it? Give me a sec. Uh, this, this is, this is uh, my structure where we, we have the magnetic core down here, you have a south uh, one, you have a north one, and they can form a half soliton here, okay? So anyway, um, so you have these magnetic for, uh, uh, um, structure here, uh, the laser beam went through the center here, the, the speed at which these traverse and the speed of the flux around the loop is dependent on the distance between these. And because they've used a laser that has a width, it can only produce in the plasma something that's uh, uh, um, wider than the laser width. So think of it like uh, creating a, a half soliton in a swimming pool where you take a plate and, and it's on a sunny day and you push the plate through the water and it creates a, a half soliton and that creates two shadows on the, the pool floor. You can only create the solitons as close as the plate that you put in there. So they're, they're limited to creating ones uh, that are wider than the, the width of the laser. Uh, and that will limit the speed at which this can traverse, uh, which is already at 0.2 of the speed of light, um, and uh, also uh, the speed at which the current can flow around the ring. So the ones that we create 
uh, resonantly can be far more energetic and far smaller. But anyway, even in this particular structure, you'll see there's a double layer of electrons at the foot leading edge of this structure. And that the, the uh, double layer voltage ranges from uh, 1.8 negative trillion volts per meter to positive at 1.8 trillion volts per meter over a distance of 0.2 of a mic 0.2 microns rather. So that is a 3.6 trillion volts per meter over two microns. This is a incredibly large uh, uh, voltage differential on the leading edge. So this, the double layer is intense here. So you will get electron bunching. Electron bunching always leads to coherence and the format matter, uh, formation of coherent matter. Okay. The second uh, thing is down here on this paper, uh, you can see what it does in 3D sense. And you can see we produce a ring and a spot, a ring and a spot. Okay. This is the Ra. This is what's on my wedding ring. Uh, <laughs> it's what's on my, I have a, I have a Ra in the center there and the chill vault and <laughs> crop circle on there. Um, but anyway, on, on the left hand side here, you can see the vortices structures and you can see the dense structure behind here. And you can see this less dense structure ahead with the vortex here. As these move in together, remember the intensity of the magnetic field and the speed of rotation and the speed of the magnetic flux core and the intensity of the flux core will increase. But um, you can also see, uh, so they're saying a thousand Teslas. I, I think they said someone was able to create something a, a, a lot, quite a bit higher with a, with a different laser uh, somewhere here. External or background magnetic fields, blah, 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 blah. In three-dimensional geometry, a smoke ring-like magnetic structure is observed. These structures convert laser energy into magnetic energy. And this is also what's in the Paul Collot paper. So I'm going to go back to the presentation here. That's absolutely, totally bang up to date work there. So let me find my presentation again, which is, which is this one, I think. Okay. Okay, so. Okay. So here's my loop, and on the on the left here we can see a, a 1950s. Oh dear, if it's going to show it, uh, a 1950s uh, uh, sort of uh, two half solitons. This is water with some dust particles. So what is the proposed mechanism? Well, um, essentially we're going to have to do uh, we're going to have to drag ourselves through a medium if we're going to want to work in space, and in fact in any medium we're going to want to have a, a medium that pervades absolutely everything. And that medium, if you have read this book, uh, which I translated from the Russian here into English here called Space Earth Human, and it's uh, by Alexander Parkamov. Uh, he found this thing called relic neutrinos, uh, and he studied these relic neutrinos, and they are between 0.1 to 2% of uh, all of the energy in the universe. And bearing in mind that luminous matter, which is stars and gas, uh, and everything you can see is 0.4%. So it could be as much as five times the amount of all of the luminous matter you see in the, in the universe is actually relic neutrinos and, uh, or neutrinos. And so what you're talking about is something that could be significantly more matter. And if you can condense this, you can make it into matter. And if you can use it as a medium through which to move, then um, you can actually... Uh, um, uh, uh, use it like that as a medium for traveling through. And, and so here's the graph on page uh, 67 of his book. And um, yeah, so he, he says that basically all neutrinos in interact with electrons, uh, the weak force effectively as well, and uh, um, gravity. Um, and in, I, when I was translating, pri prior to translating that book, I shared a couple of uh, 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 papers from various different universities. You can see the QR codes here to go and read them. So this is total reflection of relic neutrinos from meta material targets. So um, this Tokyo University found that relic neutrinos, as did uh, uh, Parkamov well before this um, uh, paper was published, uh, they, they can be reflected from solid materials. 
Uh, and do low energy relic neutrinos stimulate bees to decay? Yes, they do. And Parkamov proved that by using cobalt 60 and strontium 90, yttrium 90 isotopes through inverse beta decay. The neutrino comes in, uh, it destroys the anti neutrino, and you get uh, the element out with, with uh, the electron or positron, depending on what, what it is. Um, uh, is the element uh, ash stable? Yes, it is. Uh, and then are low energy relic neutrinos the cause of gravity? Well, CERN's theory group, I think this was in 2010, published that uh, electroweak gravity could be explained by cosmic background neutrinos. Uh, they are superfluid and their self interactions are gravitate are a gravitational theory. These dynamics arise from standard model, which is a renormal renormalizable quantum field theory. We suggest that this may actually be the gravity we observe. And this is talking to the push theory of gravity. If you're not aware of that, go and look it up. But anyway, um, uh, can low energy nu neutrino condensate explain the lack of photon emission in the new fire? This paper here by David R. Andros uh, says that essentially because of the density of cold neutrinos in the universe, they form one quantum coherent structure through the entire universe. So this is energy. This is the sea in, in, of energy in which we live, which is available at any point in the universe. And the wheel that gives us access to that is the exotic vacuum object. That is the uh, universal clutch, as, uh, as Ken Shoulders called it. I call it the monopole clutch as a riff off that. But anyway, uh, these things will be denser, and uh, Alexander Parkamov calls them neutrino spheres around gravitational bodies like the sun and like the earth. So the earth has its neutrino sphere, and the sun has a neutrino sphere, and uh, so will the moon to a degree. But anyway, uh, because of the, the structures of, of this coherent matter, um, uh, it can it, it allows for the transport of light, but also if you remove it from the environment, it may prevent the transport of light. And you actually see this in Bogdanovich's experiments where he creates solitons which light cannot pass through, um, uh, which is absolutely spectacular to see. Uh, so uh, could black holes be these things? Quite possibly. Uh, and some have suggested that they are uh, these soliton structures. Um, anyway, um, you can synthesize them and Parkamov has established how to do that. You need to get solid matter or dense plasma above a thousand Kelvin. And of course, uh, if you have uh, material uh, in cavitation, for instance, you're getting uh, cavitation bubbles collapsing, producing a temperature of 5,100 degrees Kelvin. So you're getting 50% of the solid matter producing uh, relic, relic neutrino equivalents. These are cold neutrinos at this point. So, um, that was the quickest I could possibly do to introduce you to relic neutrinos. Uh, but essentially, uh, uh, Alexander Parkamov uh, studied these over um, uh, 30 years. And uh, he used a telescope like this made out of scrap materials uh, pointing to a uh, beta isotope source there and recorded over 20 years the uh, annual cycles. And what this is, is as the Earth is closer to the sun, it comes into a more dense flux of relic neutrinos that are caused by the gravitational pull of the sun. It's not due to relic neutrinos coming from the sun. The sun does produce relic neutrinos, but they, they do not have enough velocity to escape the sun's gravitational well, but they do uh, allow transmutation on the sun. The relic neutrino flux that from the cosmos, uh, and, and Tesla uh, 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 hypothesized this as well, uh, I think in the late 1890s as well, uh, uh, but he didn't know what they were. These, these infinitesimally small corpuscles, as he called them, um, uh, but that come from the cosmos. So he had an understanding of, of, of what this sea of energy was. But anyway, so a hydrodynamic model of exotic vacuum objects. So we're going to look at this and we, we're, we're going to come into how this actually works. Uh, how, am I, how am I doing, Tim? Because uh, we're getting to the money shots now. Oh, you know, we, um, we've we still, it's only 3.30, so I guess our hard stop is probably four. If you want to just go all the way through, okay, that's all fine. Right. I'll, but... I'll do what I need to do, and then I, I, I've got plenty of supporting materials if uh, anyone needs anything explained okay. further. So I'll just I'll do what I can. Okay, so uh, if you could imagine hydrodynamic structures, there's material that's flowing around the front, capturing from the back, gathering other EVOs, and hopefully if someone looked at the presentations that I asked to be shared, um, they would have seen this in the video of Sprites that I first observed in 2017 when I visited Suhas Raukar's lab in Mumbai. Uh, can they pass through one another? Um, they come from the side. What am I talking about? I'm talking about these things. And this is the video that I asked people to look at. And it's uh, on YouTube. 
And this is a very powerful um, ultrasonic horn. I think it's at about 20 kilohertz, 19.46 kilohertz. It's in water. You can see the dust particles or whatever detritus flowing around in this water cylinder. But we already know from a Mars of vibrator plates, and you can go and see my work on that, that these produce counter-rotating vortex structures, half solitons, because of the resonant nodes. It's actually a yin-yang structure. And we have a, a, an experimental series called uh, Ultra, which you can conduct yourself, and it costs about $35, and you can transmute elements with that with about 20 minutes of learning. Um, and it also synthesizes iron-rich crenellated uh, iron oxide spheres, as well as range of elements from aluminium foil. Um, you, it creates these solitons, and uh, you can see them being emitted from uh, focal points and resonant nodes on, on this horn that's in the water. And they're able to travel through the water much, much, much faster than the water, and they uh, is drifting. And they also don't appear to travel in the direction necessarily that the water is drifting either. They, they, they go in the direction that they want to go, but they also join, merge and destroy each other. But what I'm showing down here on the, and you can go and study this, uh, uh, oh, sorry. You can go and study this in your own time. What I'm showing here is a, a full soliton here. And uh, you can see this structure. I, 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 I call it the pretzel. And we've seen this. I, sh I showed it to you on the outside of the um, tungsten rod that was exposed to a Mars gas. Uh, that's gas onto a solid producing these half or uh, so these vortices, these half solitons. The same thing is on the 10 yen coin that was exposed to a Mars gas. So you've got a vortex going around here and a vortex going around here. But this is actually a full soliton, OK, uh, like this soliton here. And what it's doing in each of these cases is it's depressurizing the area in front. Now, I'll come in to explain why I know that. It's also depressurizing a beam behind its center of its core behind, OK? Here is a smoke-filled soliton, and they've used a laser beam that's uh, uh, spread in an arc to cut a slice through and show a slice through the uh, um, the smoke ring as it's coming away from the emitter. And what you can see is here in front, this kind of weird kind of dome. And this is the same dome you see on the monopoles that are recorded on x-rays from various authors, uh, which they call birdies, or, or <laughs> I think Vishnevsky calls it, a, is it Vishnevsky? Oh, anyway, Perostikov, he calls it, he calls it a, a mushroom. And that's what it looks like, actually, when you cut through it. But anyway, um, what's happening here is you've got the, the cohering forces, your, your uh, auspicious symbol, your right auspicious symbol and your left, left auspicious symbol as you slice through this structure. And they are coherent the mat, cohering the matter down. And this travels in this direction. It always travels in this direction. And you've got this dome above. And what it's doing is it's moving. As I've sh shown you, there is a, a magnetic field of a thousand Tesla, but the magnetic field has a direction. And so whatever is the small things that are responsible for magnetics, whatever that is, and maybe they are cold neutrinos, relic neutrinos, they are being pulled around by this. Now we know electrons interact with neutrinos, so we've got electrons moving around and we have a 3.6 trillion uh, uh, volts per meter over two microns in a small, not, not a very, small, a big one, a, a one that's not optimal, uh, produced in that Chinese and, and American paper. And so essentially we have this soliton, and this is smoke particles, which you can think of as ions in your Ken Shoulders exotic vacuum objects that are being carried by the movement of the air. Okay, again, this one here is smoke particles that are being carried by the movement of the air. This is smoke and CO2 that is being carried by the movement of the air in this Danish uh, 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 waste processing factory that, that produces a soliton to shoot the CO2 up into the atmosphere. And, and each one is, I think it's like half a ton of CO2 in each of these solitons. And it, free, it cools the air or something, causes this condensed smoke ring uh, that goes up into the air. Uh, if you want to go and see a very nice smoke ring, go and look at the back, the cannon at the end of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as well. There's a wonderful smoke ring that comes out of the cannon at the end of that wonderful movie. But anyway, in this case, what you're seeing in this water cavitation system 
is the cavitator produces billions of nanobubbles and they adiabatically compress to nanostructure size so that the water is absolutely replete with these gas, it, gas dissolved in the water. And what's happening here is this is depressurizing the area in front. So these bubbles grow. And it's also having, has a beam behind it where it depressurizes the air, the water behind it. And so you have material that gets sucked in and it literally gets sucked in, okay? And so uh, that's why you see these bubbles. So um, the same thing is occurring in this soliton, the same thing is occurring in this soliton. And the structure is there in that uh, 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 supercomputer developed model. So I'm, I'm saying that in this case, the particles of uh, dust are being shifted around and the fluid is the air. In here, it's bubbles that are being shifted around in, in the fluid, in the vortex in, in the fluid. And you can actually get gas moving through fluid as well. But these are the same structures. Now, what am I saying is the fluid in space? The fluid in space is the super fluid coherent condensate of cold neutrinos which can interact with the electrons and the magnetic field going around here, and they can co cohere them. Now, anything, anything spinning will produce those birdies that Bogdanovich saw, uh, those uh, solitons, those structures, those kind of things that, that um, Arit Aritzkiev saw on, on his Iron 57 that I showed you earlier. So if I go back here, many authors have seen let me show you, let me show you. They have seen, I can find it again. Ooh, and, uh, um, well, it's basically this structure. <laughs> uh, these, this, this is an X-ray uh, and I've just colorized it to match the opposite of the pole here, okay? And what you're looking is 50% through this structure. So you've got the area where the stuff is pulled in and you've got the stuff where it's sprayed out the top, the dome on the top. This is the same as you are seeing, but in this case, these are electrons that are being uh, shifted around. And that's why uh, it, it uh, leaves a mark on the silver bromide on the X-ray film, okay? Um, where are we? So you can imagine that this has the soliton here. And if you imagine that thing overlaid here, it would be shifting the material around here and it's spinning around, spinning around. It's depressurizing the area in front of it, hence the bubbles are there, but also it's sucking things in from behind. So it depressurizes this area over here. Same thing going on here, same thing going on here. But this is in water, this is in air, and we are in space. So using this technology, you could have the same propulsion system that worked underwater, in air, and in space. And it is not reliant on gravity. It's not reliant on gravity. You would need maybe different intensities, but what I've told you already is that depending on the energization level, you can get the structure to spin a vortex such that it's, it's synthesizing elements, or it's producing UV, or it's producing X-rays, and you would use a different level of energization to work underwater, work in the air, and work in space. But principally, the main medium is through electrons and electron interaction via soliton structure uh, with the ether comprised of relic neutrinos, which pass through everything. They are partially reflected. This is proven by the work of this guy here and by some of the other papers that I've shown you. It is, according to CERN's group, a perfect thing of gravity. And if you think of it as a push model of gravity, uh, if you can prevent that material from interacting with some material, there is no gravity there. It, it does what that ball lightning does in those examples I gave you at the beginning of the presentation. So, Okay, so uh, what is a magnet? The real magnet is the substance that is circulating in the metal. Each particle in the substance is an individual magnet by itself and by um, both north and south pole in, in individual magnets. They are so small that it can pass through anything. In fact, they can pass through metal easier than through air. 
they are in constant motion. They are running on one, they're running one kind of magnets against the other. And if guided in the right channels, they possess perpetual power. The North and South Pole magnets, they are a cosmic force. They hold together this earth and everything on it. Each North and South Pole magnet is equal uh, in strength, but the strength of each individual magnet doesn't amount to anything. To be of practical use, they will have to be in great numbers. In a permanent magnet, they are circulating in the metal in great numbers. This is the forward in a magnetic current by Edward Leed Scallon from 1945. I propose that the micro uh, leptons, these chargeless but large, they can be microns to millimeters in the case of the ones that were studied by uh, Alexander Parkamov. They have a small magnetic moment, but when they are cohered into solitons, they can increase their magnetic moment to unimaginable intensities. And in the case of the quantum mechanical calculation by, uh, um, uh, that I gave you earlier by Lutz Yetner, it can yield 50 million Teslas. Okay, so, so you, can, you can do gravity uh, decay of, uh, of matter. So if you imagine I'm depressurizing that water, if I depressurize matter, i.e. I remove all influence from the relic neutrino flux on it, and I'm grabbing the electrons of it, there are actually elements, like if you take a, a perfectly stable isotope of, of uh, um, thallium-205, and you iron, completely deionize it, you completely remove all the, sorry, you completely ionize it, you remove all of the electrons, it beta decays spontaneously. It's stable till the end of the universe, but if you remove all the electrons, it just beta decays. And it, it releases an electron and becomes lead 205, okay? So, uh, which has a very long half-life. So this is, so if you can suck all the electrons off something, but if you can then grab that matter as an ion, because it's going to be highly ionized at that point, and you can insert it into the vortex, into this soliton, which can compress to five orders of magnitude more than the center of the core of the sun, you are going to cause the, the things to become neutrons. So you can then, and in fact, according to uh, Takaaki Matsumoto, and according to the observations uh, or uh, his observations, and according to the observations of, of S.V. Adamenko from Proton 21 Labs, and our own observations, you can completely destroy matter. And this is exactly what occurs in uh, some Hutchison effect samples. I'm going to read you the preface. Now, uh, we are producing a one-for-one -one copy of this book, which is going to be available off my blog. In fact, you can get the first 42 pages now. I recommend you read it. It's absolutely incredible what this guy discovered and what he shared. Uh, and in fact, much of what he, he realized was by 1995. Uh, and he talks uh, about many of the concepts that we're talking here. But anyway, I'll just read you his preface. Far out in the universe, nuclear collapses very often take place by the gravitational force after stars consume their fuel. Since the electromagnetic force is about 40 orders stronger than the gravitational force, it should be easy to induce similar nuclear collapses by electromagnetic force in laboratory. But we never knew until now how to do that. Recently, the author discovered a nuclear collapse which was induced by the electromagnetic force in laboratory during studying the mechanisms of so-called cold fusion phenomena. Several kinds of nuclear reaction which were directly induced by the electromagnetic force called electronuclear reactions, ENRs, were found so far to occur in a special state of hydrogen clusters called itonic clusters, or micro ball lightning, BL. The nuclear collapse was one of the most remarkable reactions among electronuclear reactions, called electronuclear collapse, ENC. Furthermore, very amazingly, completely broken materials by electronuclear collapse were found to be regenerated again to thin tubes and films of conven conventional elements such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. We have observed this in many systems. Yul Brown observed it when he exposed radioactive material to um, uh, a Mars uh, to HHO in the 1980s. Uh, he observed that it converted mostly to carbon. Many authors have, uh, have observed this. This is electronuclear regeneration. This book collects in, uh, reviews and original papers related to electronuclear reactions uh, and so on. Okay, so when you electrically nuclear collapse material and you convert it into light and leptons, 
What are you doing? You are doing exactly what those Russian authors said in their 1992 CIA release. They are extracting the hidden energy within matter. One kilogram of iron is perfectly sufficient for an interstellar journey. And we know from Lutz Yeitner's calculations that the electrons on the outside of a small condensed plasmoid can travel at 0.8 of the speed of light, which would get you to and back from Alpha Centauri in 12 years, according exactly to what the Russians claimed in 1992, using exotic vacuum object structures. The propulsion is this. The propulsion can work in all mediums and it extracts, it can extract the energy. And I believe it has this disruptive beam. John Hutchison has observed this disruptive beam. Eugene Podkle Podklebnov has observed this destructive beam, but they are spinning things at nowhere near the velocity that these can spin. I've shown you that large natural ball lightning can have an outer rotation speed of one third of the speed of light. One third of the speed of light. Imagine trying to get a superconducting disk. This is a superconducting disk. <laughs> But try to get a lab superconducting disk spinning at one third of the speed of light. Doesn't matter what you use, it's going to fall apart. You can't do it this way. You can do it with exotic vacuum objects. And in doing so, you are able to tractor through the universe. And you are able to depressure rise the physical vacuum, which is composed of a superfluid condensate of cold neutrinos which comprises nearly five times the much density as the density of all luminous matter in the universe and is a large component of the dark matter in the universe. You can decompress in front and you're compressing it behind. And you have this channel which decompresses. So if you had your fuel source behind the soliton, it would literally rip the matter apart. And we see this in the lab. We see one side ripped apart and it dumping it down on the other side if you've got a half soliton. But if you take the full soliton, there's a beam that comes out which can tear matter apart, nucleon by nucleon. And when it gets in, it converts it into uh, uh, light and leptons. And the two can then produce forward motion uh, and uh, be self-perpetuating. Uh, so let me go forward, I'm nearly there. So. The soliton likes to eat material around it, which we observed as it burrowed through uh, uh, silicon carbide and through alumina in the shoulders work. We've observed it going through concrete, uh, and you can also see this going through glass in natural ball lightning. And it, it likes to eat the material behind it. This is the pod Kletnoff and, and, and uh, uh, observations by um, John Hutchison. In the case of the smoke ring, it, it, it is smoke particles and air behind it. It does this by lowering the air pressure in front. In the case of ultrasonic tank in Suha's lab, it appears to lower the water pressure behind and adjacent so much so that it causes nanobubbles to reform from the water where they are ordinarily imperceptibly small. In the case of Bogdanovich, it eats light. It can literally eat light. It's a, uh, because the light can't transport itself through something uh, um, where there's no flux. Now, I'm going to tell you something, which is really, this, this, is, um, this is very, very important. I want people to listen to this. There's a guy called Alexander Shishkin. And when I was in Sochi in 2018, giving a presentation there on some of the earlier work that I was doing, on, not in a presentation, but on the side, he, he said this. And it was following a discussion, I think, with... with, with um, uh, Alexander Parkhamov. Alexander Parkhamov has a, a reactor, uh, which is just a, a, an inductor coil that goes down, it hits something and it produces a spark. So you get a very high DIDT change. He was observing strange radiation. He was observing these things, which are these birdies, these magnetic monopole structures coming out. But sometimes it did work and sometimes it didn't work, produce these things. It would produce it for a period and it didn't work, right? Then there is the work of, uh, uh, of Shishkin. He found that if he had a, a, a cavitator, which was a disc spinning, I don't know, a few thousand RPM in water, it would produce such a cavitation, a, a, such a flux of these birdies that one hour exposure would kill a human, okay? Because of the radiation damage of the, the, uh, the ions that they were transporting through the metal casing, 
when they exploded in your body, they would damage your cells and cause DNA damage. He concluded that these things, which, which the broader group is, he calls them magnetotoro electrical radiation. And he says they're the same as an exotic vacuum object, which is the same as ball lightning. He says the neutral form are called string vortex solitons, and they're most likely because they, they transmute beta isotopes. He, they're most likely uh, made of condensed cold neutrinos. And in the case of the cavitation that's occurring in his cavitator, they will be synthesizing cold neutrinos rather than harnessing. But what he did find was that after a period of time, it stopped producing the strange radiation. And you know how he got it working again? He would literally physically lift the device and move it to another part of the laboratory, turn it on again, it would start producing strange radiation again. It has an event horizon. And we've shown this in some of our extreme interactions from Vega experiments. There is an event horizon around the coherence. It's literally like an event horizon in a black hole. And within that space, it's not looking for the air, it's sucking these magnetic, these miniature magnets, these, these, these uh, relic neutrinos that are cosmic nu neutrinos, and it's absorbing them. It's absorbing them and cohering them into these condensed solitons. And so this shows that it's actually cohering the matter into a coherent structure. There was a guy called, and I've done a large presentation on this, and I also asked people to look at this video, but I'll just run over the main points. This guy called Xu Wenju in China, and from 1988 to 1999, he did a series of studies using three body alignments. Now, there was a guy, guy called Morris Alai. He won the Nobel Prize for economics in the 80s, I think, or something. But in 1954, and you can go and look at it on NASA's site, he found that during a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse, a focal pendulum had a major, like a so, during a solar eclipse, it had a major deviation, a deviation from its precession, a focal pendulum. In this study that was done by Xu Wenju between 1988 and 1999 with his team in China, they found four observations. One, if they had a metal sheet with a weight and strain gauges during a three body alignment, which is a lens for relic neutrinos, and this is all talked about in uh, uh, Alexander Parkamov's book, he found that there was a sideways force, right? Why is that? That's because you've got the, you've got the, the cosmic neutrinos that are uh, called relic neutrinos that are lensed by the sun and they go towards the earth. That's the other you know, uh, part of the lens and the moon's in the way. And as it hits there, they're refracted and reflected, partially reflected. So there, there is a lower flux from the cosmogenic flux in the shadow under uh, in the eclipse. And so you get a diffusion from the side. You get a diffusion from the side. This is what Morris Elias saw in 1954. It's on the NASA website. You get a diffusion from the side. And this is what Xu Wenzhou observed in 1988 to 1999. And the diffusion from the side causes this sideways movement the sideways movement. This is pressure. This is pressure. And the pressure is from the difference in the uh, density of the condensate. Now, it, it might be a bit weird, but when you get a condensate of anything, you can have two, as in a Cooper pair, occupying the space, same space time, or you can have a Google Plex occupying the same space time. So it's still a condensate of electrons, but there's more in one place than in other places. It's like, it's, 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 it's the, the same, but not the same, if you know what I mean. So this condensate of uh, coherent relic neutrinos through the universe, they are more dense a condensate around the sun and around the moon and around the earth. And these are the neutrino spheres, okay? So this is where it's most dense. But when you have this free body alignment, you get this sideways movement. The other three things he observed were spectrum from elements changes. Why? Because light has to transport through the neutrino condensate. This is in one of the papers that I shared earlier. And so if you have a more dense or a less dense uh, condensate, then the light changes its speed. It changes its speed. Secondly, we observed this in Lena experiments. I said that there's a polarization 
uh, effect occurring. And, and we've seen some spectacular ones on the Vega Valley where you have green sections and, and uh, red sections and then green sections where this, this uh, patch of alternating uh, yin-yang structures organize, self-organize themselves. Because you've got the, the magnetic field flowing around one way in one case and flowing around the other in the other case, and they can live in metals indefinitely, either it's modifying the surface or it's magnetic. We know that the polarization of light can be changed by a magnetic field. Now, if you have a magnetic field, my friends, which is a thousand Tesla or 50 million Tesla, that's going to change the polarization a lot. It's going to change it all the way over to one side. And if the thing's the other pole, it's going to change it all the way over to the other side. So this is why we see on the Vega Valley, in my view, this polarization. This is why we can detect strange radiation influence on materials, because they change the polarization of the light that's in, impinging on the material. It leaves a shadow in the material. So he observed a different spectrum. This shouldn't happen. When you're looking at an element and you're energizing it and you're getting a spectrum of light back, it should always be the same, but it's not the case during a three body alignment. And that's because the neutrino condensate density has changed. Thirdly, he found that atomic clocks change their speed. And what are atomic clocks based on? They're based on rubidium 87 or cesium 138. Uh, sorry, sorry, cesium, <laughs> sorry, rubidium 87 or, or cesium. Uh, 137. And these are some of the isotopes that uh, um, Alexander Parkhamov has been able to accelerate their decay using gravita using partial reflection uh, focusing in his telescope over decades. So it's the same effect. But Xu and Zhu didn't know what this was. The last thing was, if he had a lead tin alloy, if he had a lead tin alloy, and he was it was in a molten phase, and he let it crystallize then he would get lines. And what are the lines? I believe the lines are diffraction. As the, as the cold neutrino condensate is coming round and it's a different density, it spreads in some and you get diffraction lines like you do in a slip experiment. It has a wavelength, it has a Broglie wavelength. And Xu Wenzhou did know, not know what all these things were, but they were 100% gravity related. And they are because of cold neutrinos. And this is what this technology can do. So I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done. I know you're coming in there, Tim. So I'm nearly done. So uh, in the case of ultrasonic tank, uh, so on, uh, in case of Bogdanovich, it eats light. Uh, John Hutchison, UK, it disrupts the matter itself by releasing light pressure on the matter. Uh, in the latter cases, it is gravity driven decay, uh, very in line with the 1990 claims of Takaki Matsumoto during his cold fusion experiments. And so the implications are using this now proven principle, one can propel oneself at extreme speeds in any medium, just as Tesla claimed in newspapers in 1910s, though I would not want to be close to it uh, in the disruption zone. So if you had one of these devices, it would cause disruption to like metals principally very easily. So you'd get like, if you, need, if you had it near a car, but firstly, anything with electromagnetics or anything that uses quantum processes like, like uh, uh, Josephson's junction, normal computers will not work near this technology, right? That's one thing. Your consciousness will not work when you're inside because your consciousness needs to work through the cold neutrino condensate, okay? And uh, if it's near any metals, the metals would distort, okay? And uh, if, if uh, uh, and you would also get weird uh, changes in uh, uh, temperature. It would produce uh, hot areas and, and intense, intense, intense cold areas because it's doing this single bath thermal extraction process. And you would also get little iron microspheres coming out, crenellated iron microspheres. There's so many things that would come and also the ionization things. On the other hand, a device using this technology for flight could fix Fukushima, Chernobyl and NOE, and NOE tank atoll potentially in minutes just by hovering above them. It could also deactivate nuclear weapons. It could deactivate them in two ways, one, it could actually remediate the nuclear materials in there, principally the plutonium, by the intense neutron flux, sorry, intense cold neutrino flux. It could also deactivate the electronics. In fact, it would deactivate anything. You, you'd stop a spark being produced. All kinds of things would stop working next near this technology that we use in our modern world. It's not compatible with our modern world, this, this technology. And you would also need structures that, that, that were pyramidal to launch off preferentially, so you didn't hurt the people as you launched. 
One can transmute matter trivially inside the exotic vacuum object. Air will likely become small, highly magnetic iron spheres, as we have observed in NOVA, microwave dusty plasma experiment, Lion, deuterium nickel diamond experiment, Ultra, $35 ultrasonic cleaner experiment, and Vega, the plasma experiments, which cost a few hundred dollars. This is the structure. And to finish off, I'm really nearly there, Tim. I'm really nearly there. This is the order of electrical engineers from the 1890s in the UK. In the center, it has the Maltese cross, okay? And it says, out of darkness cometh light. On the right-hand side, you have this, I shared this in 2017 on 9th of June in my ASTI presentation in Italy. And this is the Maltese cross with the, with the Ra symbol in the center, okay? This is a Sumerian god, okay? When I found this structure, and counted on John Hutchison's sample, I found 48 divisions around it, 48 divisions, okay? And I thought, that's interesting. That looks a little bit like something I saw on that stele when I did that presentation in 2017. And I came and looked at this, this structure here. And in fact, it has two disks which appear to have 48 uh, divisions around it. And one is smaller above, okay? So I thought, what, what, what is that? What is that? So I went to find out where this image came from and it's in the, the, uh, the London Museum. And they have a description of what each of these symbols means. And do you know what this disc is? This, this symbol here? According to the British Museum, it is the flying disc of the sky gods. The flying disc of the sky gods, 48 divisions. And here, I, I thought, what's this fez-like structure, like the one he's got on his head? That is the headdress of the flying gods. I'll let you guess what the other two are. You know how many divisions there are around the ARV? There is 48 divisions. I don't think that's a coincidence. In the magnetic, the mercury that's, that's described in the Vimana, mercury is used by uh, um, Ken Shoulders. And it was used by uh, um, the death ray when he wasn't using tungsten wire, he was using mercury in, in um, Tesla's death ray. If you have a vortex in the center, just as we produce in our $35 experiments, you will produce coherent matter and this will transmute. But what it will do it by spinning the mercury vortex, you will have a point at the center of coherence. And this will produce the point that's in the center of the overall vortex structure. So it will start to move the cold neutrino or uh, the relic neutrino condensate around the craft. So by spinning mercury, you will create the core of the structure. What they are doing here is they are spinning the outside, which will then also create the core. This is why you can't have any living being in the central core here. You can't have it, okay? And to be able to control this, you will change the polarity on the structures here. And by using piezoelectrics here, and I think Mark McCanglish said they used, um, they used, uh, what is it? Uh, I think they used quartz and they used uh, barium titanate. By creating sound in barium titanate, you create resonant nodes, which are exactly the same as we do in our ultra experiment that create coherent matter points. The coherent matter points will create these solitons, the string vortex solitons, and they will come out. And then by doing field manipulation around there, by spinning it around that way and spinning around that, that you can vector in different directions. This would be good about, about going up and falling down and vectoring left and right. But you, if you wanted to create a spacecraft that was fully controllable, you would have a, a disk that's like that on the top and, and that on the bottom. And you would have one soliton set below, one soliton below and one soliton above, and you would vector their, their angles. You could also do it in a cylindrical shape and have them on the end. And if you wanted to avoid the consciousness problems that you will inevitably get in, when you're inside something like this, you would start putting them uh, on the corners of a triangle. And that would be the minimum structure you would need in order to pr provide a space in a center where humans could consciously exist easily, um, uh, but still have full vectoring potential uh, uh, using this technology. And you would have to coat the structure with lead paint to avoid the UV and the X-ray exposure. So that is that.
Here are similar devices and the, the flying device with the, the, the uh, cohering forces of the ring and the spot, the ring and the spot and the material coming in and the yin, yang, yin, yang, yin, yang around the outside. Uh, this is the ancient technology. This is the occult technology. I, I'm pretty sure Tesla will have known this. And, you know, his, his Wardenclyffe Tower was a D4D court toroid at the top. And it was a golden ratio outside structure. It used the fuel of oxygen and nitrogen in the air, and it will have produced iron crenelated microspheres. And it would not just be a transmitter, it would have been a generator. You could use the same technology to generate energy. And if you got it right, you could generate energy at any point in the universe, and you could also cohere it. So uh, there we go. I think uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's, someone asked me a question before I came into this presentation. They said, uh, how, how could um, uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects allow for the, the ball in, in John Hutchison's uh, experiment to lift off the ground? Well, uh, you, you can just go and look at the temple uh, dragons which are based off Indian temple dragons, uh, the foe dragon, foo dragons in the front of the, the Forbidden Palace, Central Palace Temple. Uh, and that is the same structure uh, as the fleur de, uh, fleur de, uh, flower of life structure on Temple of Osiris in Egypt, where it's kind of like laser burned on the, on the, on the structure there. This, this forms a mesh, which I can show you images that we've observed that Takayaki Matsumoto has observed. It forms a mesh over the structure and it basically shields up from the effect of gravity uh, in, in the environment. And so that, and then small magnetic changes would have lev levitated the ball. They would be highly sensitive to magnetic changes. So I, I think we're, we're about done really. Um, there we go. That's infinite energy and, and, and propulsion at any point in the universe. Wow. I, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say. Wow. And that's an enormous presentation too. Okay, so let's let's do this. Uh, that was Bob, as small as I could make it. <laughs> would Would you like to come back in the future? That's let, let me see if you're open to it. But but let's let me do this first of all. Let me put this on gallery view. Everyone, give Bob an enormous, tremendous hand. That's I mean you just yeah I mean you're like a you're like a freight train you just kept going right through it it's like you know just more and more and more and more and more I was like wow it's just brain mind blowing so I just it, it, I'm sorry for those people that because I I started laying out how this occurs I've I've not said some of the things that I've said today and and I I understood in May two thousand was it no it's March March two thousand seventeen from studying those sprites moving through water, likely how this occurred. But it, it, I, I had to see the physical evidence in vast numbers of experiments by independent authors. And then I discovered Matsumoto, then I discovered Solin, then I saw the Lockheed Martin patents, and then I learned about Boyd Bushman and the magnetic effect on gravity and, and, and so on. And so, and, and obviously my, my relationship with John Hutchison and then studying so many samples in incredible depth with John Hutchison. Yeah. And yeah. everything is the same. It's all the same. It is occult technology. It's the hidden technology. This will have been used widely over the, over the planet because the symbols of the, the, the principal symbols that you can observe on materials that you treat using this technology are the major power symbols in all cultures around the world and their ancient symbols before the last ice age. So um, it, it, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, uh, we're in the dawn of the Quarius. I actually specifically say we're, we're at the beginning of an old age. Wonderful. Bob, thank you, sir. 